Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Unauthorized Disclosure Podcast. I'm Kevin Gastola, and I'm joined by Rania Kalik. Hey, Rania. Hey, and, Kevin. Something's a little different today. <laughs> yeah, and as you can see, Loki is 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 in the house. He's literally I just in bumped your into house. him. He's. I just bumped into him on the side of the street <laughs> randomly, and I was like, "Hey, you want to come on the show? We're about to record." And he was like, "Sure." He's That's what happens. For, he's here for an episode. <laughs> Uh, an episode that people who are subscribers uh, knew we were going to do at some point, and we're very pleased to be able to have him on. And I'll give him a proper introduction, since uh, for those who don't know who Loki is, um, you're an artist, um, you're a rapper, you are a poet, you are an activist, and you're also a commentator, and you're the host of the Watchdog podcast at Mint Press News. So thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's good to be here. And uh, I, I suppose uh, when, when we wanted to have you on, uh, there was a campaign that you were waging uh, to make sure your music was not removed from Spotify. Uh, but it seems like uh, knowing your, uh, your background, knowing what you uh, dive into and cover on a regular basis, your activism on Palestinian human rights, that is probably best if we begin with the tragic story of, of Shireen, who was killed um, this, this past week, who was murdered, but I'll use the right language, was murdered by Israeli military forces. And uh, I, want, I, I got some slides together to show um, of, of this horrible coverage that we have in the West of, of the Al Jazeera journalist is killed during clashes in the West Bank. Shireen Abu Akleh, and it says the circumstances surrounding the fatal shooting of Shireen Abu Akleh, a Palestinian American journalist, were not immediately clear, even though it actually was. Uh, we've got the Independent from the United Kingdom saying that the voice of Palestine was gunned down, how Shireen Abu Akleh fell victim to the conflict she covered. And then you notice the subheading says her death is already sending shockwaves across the Middle East and Israel, uh, so playing up the conflict. And then uh, we've got New York Times jumping in here with a latest update. Did Israelis or Palestinians shoot Al Jazeera journalist? <laughs> Bullet may hold clues as if um, we've got a conspiracy theory to get to the bottom of here. So uh, these are all, by the way, these screenshots credit to Alan McLeod over at Mint Press News for compiling them. But let's uh, get your thoughts. Oh, and I also, I pulled that down too early because I've got your uh, tribute here that you sent out from your account on Twitter uh, saying the Israeli occupation killed Shireen Abu Akleh and then naming all of these journalists who have been murdered by Israeli forces who all wore clothing identifying themselves as press. So uh, why don't you uh, go ahead and uh, and give us your uh, commentary on this murder. Well, I've just come today from Markez um, al-Thaqafi, the Mukhayyam Shatila, Shatila camp. This is a place where four generations, bordering on five now, of Palestinians are languishing in really, really harsh conditions and they stand as a testament to Israel's violence on an industrial scale towards the Palestinians um, and others of the region. Shirin Abu Akhle was a journalist who came to prominence in the Intifada uh, Mathania. She was well known to be the face of the coverage that Al Jazeera gave. She was with the channel from the first year of its inception in 1996. Um, and she, sh she served with all professionalism at all times. Now, what we saw was she was shot in an area underneath her helmet, which would imply that it was aimed with the specific purpose of killing her. The Israeli foreign ministry, the Israeli prime minister, initially put out a video trying to muddy the waters and smear 
من مقاومين انجنين who have been fighting heroically against one of the world's most advanced armies to protect themselves and their community and let's not forget what the Israeli occupation and military did to Jenin in the second intifada people were besieged people were eating animals people were eating cats in Jenin because of what the Israeli military was doing to them in 2002 and they completely destroyed Jenin now you have someone like Shirin standing in her position and the witness accounts of those who were with her said that we were all standing facing the Israeli military. There was no clash going on. And so what the Israeli foreign ministry and the Israeli prime minister and government put out through their Twitter feeds, and even I read somewhere that the uh, one branch of the US government had shared the video. It was a video taken from the side of the Muqawma in Jenin of them shooting down an alley. Now, what Beit Salem did with brilliant work was locate exactly where that alley was. The suggestion on the Israeli side was that, and you can hear people talking in the clip about hitting a soldier. And so what the Israelis tried to do is imply very strongly that the people that were shooting down the alley to defend their area had actually hit Shirin and thought they'd hit a soldier. That's what the Israelis tried to say. Beit Salem went exactly to the place and showed that it was not the same place. It would have been physically impossible for that bullet to have hit Shirin. In addition to that, those that have seen the video, and I don't, I wouldn't encourage anyone to necessarily see the video, but when you look at the wound in her face, to me, as a, you know, an unprofessional um, opinion, it looks consistent with a bullet wound that could be caused by the exploding bullets that the Israelis used against Palestinians trying to exercise their right under UN Resolution 194 and return home in Masirat al auda in Gaza um, in 2008 and otherwise. So you've seen this disfiguring of the truth on an industrial scale again and again. And this exposes the pious hypocrisy of both our political and media class who are unable to bring themselves to admit the reality of what has happened. Since when have you seen witness accounts from a, a major news channel so easily dismissed? These are journalists who have seen where she's been shot and who are saying that she was shot by the Israeli military. Yet it is being swept aside as if, you know, it, there, there's some type of question marks around it. I do not see how even the biased Israeli investigation that will take place and will be, um, you know, clearly aiming to um, absolve the Israeli military will be able to conclude anything, but it would take some extreme acrobatics to try and pin this on the Palestinian resistance. And even if which we know is not the case, even if it is still the Israeli occupation that killed Shirin Abu Aqla and James Miller and Yasser Murtaja. You know, on that uh, Masirat al auda from Gaza, Yasser Murtaja had press written directly across his chest and he was targeted with a sniper. We saw absolutely nothing said about this. You know, of course, this is horrific and terrible what happened to Jamal Khashoggi. In, in Turkey. But is there a difference because he worked for Jeff Bezos at the Washington Post in comparison to what has happened with Shirin Abu Akhla? We have to really be very clear. Israel has an established war against journalism. And part of that war against journalism could, can bring us into the campaign against me because one of the main fronts, again, set up in the Second Intifada was BICOM in Britain. Now, BICOM's main purpose is to lobby people in the media to present Israel the way they want it to be presented. It was founded as a sort of PR nerve center. It's led by Richard Pater, who is currently a reserve in the Israeli military. Um, it's also 
you know, has had numerous British journalists across it featuring in it. You know, the director was Mark Berg, who went from working for the BBC to then working for Bicom. And then from working for Bicom, he went back to working for the BBC on some of their biggest flagship shows. You know, Bicom coordinates directly with the Israeli embassy on anti-BDS um, things. It's uh, funded by Pojo Zabludovic. Pojo, Pojo Zabludovic um, got his wealth from his father's business, Soltam Systems, which was a weapons company which was subsumed into Elbit Systems. Now, when we look at the campaign against me to get me off Spotify, it's coming from an organization called We Believe in Israel. We Believe in Israel was mentioned by Shai, Shai Massoud, the Israeli political um, director of the uh, the embassy um, in the Al Jazeera lobby documentary when he was secretly filmed. He talks about We Believe in Israel and Bicom being part of the same office, being in the same office. Now, We Believe in Israel is a project of Bicom. So the very same organization that has a war against journalism in this country is also working to take me off Spotify. So this is kind of where everything meets. We have more evidence of very serious question marks around cybersecurity companies that filter the emails of some of the biggest media companies in the world, the details of which I will be releasing when I am no longer in Beirut. And, uh, you know, there's a lot here in terms of Israel's war against journalism. And the more and more people scratch on that, the less I think people get into this um, kind of lamenting of the reality and the more people get into clear material action and working hard on, 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 um, on going deeper and deeper into these relationships, the more progress we can make. We need this to give birth to a real criticality about what Israel does, not just in Palestine, but in the rest of the world. Yeah, that's really well said. It's like it's also like an encyclopedic uh, walkthrough um, of how everything is connected. But since you brought up the issue of Spotify, I think a lot of our our listeners and viewers are aware that there's this been this massive campaign against you by the Israel lobby to get your music off Spotify. So can you walk us through what happened? What's been the response to this? Because there was quite an outpouring of support, and impressively, by like a lot of people in Hollywood, even. Thank you. I mean, well, also, I just want to add one more point. We have to connect what happened to Shirin Abu Aqaleh, pardon me, to what happened to the five Palestinian and Arab journalists at Deutsche Welle, mm. the German media company. Now, Deutsche Welle brought in Paulina Griev, who formerly was the editor of the IDF's magazine, and simultaneously as working for Deutsche Welle as a social media guru, she um, is employed by the Israel Public Policy Forum, which is funded by the Israeli government. Now, I'm not necessarily drawing a causal line between the dismissal of these Palestinians from their jobs, but it would be naive not to put serious question marks upon the role of somebody who's employed by the Israeli government and simultaneously employed by DW as a social media guru. You have another person that works as a Middle East um, editor at uh, Deutsche Welle, who previously worked for um, an Israel lobby group, um, an, uh, an organization that builds relations between Germany and Israel. Now, the thing with what Israel is doing in the media and the way then that comes into the campaign against me, um, the allegation is that my music incites violence against Israelis. Now, we have to remember that according to the Palestinian Prisoners Studies Center, between 2015 and 2018, 500 Palestinians were arrested, supposedly for inciting violence against Israel, for things they posted on the internet. And many of them were journalists and many of them were children. So it's a familiar thing that Israel do arresting Palestinian journalists for incitement, for them covering simply the truth of what is happening to them. You know, when we think of this issue of incitement, you even have the example of someone like Tamara Abu Leban, who was a 15 year old in Al Quds, who wrote on her Facebook, forgive me. That day she was raided by Israeli police 
and arrested. You also have the case of Darin Tatur, who wrote the beautiful poem on her Facebook, Qawim Ya Sha'bi Qawim Hum. Um, she is a Palestinian citizen of the Zionist entity. Darin Tatur then went through three years in and out of the courts, house arrest, went into prison for five months. When she was in prison, she requested a pen for her to write more poetry. And she was told by her jailer, you, especially you, will not get a pen. And Darin Tatur took her zipper off her jacket and wrote her poetry on the wall. Once she was released, she was then given an award by Oxfam at The Hague for freedom of expression. There are so many examples. You look at someone like Ghassan Kanafani, you look at someone like Najil Ali, murdered in London. There are many, many examples of people who have covered the truth of what Israel does and have paid the price with their life. Now, what's happening to me is not quite at that level thus far. What is happening is concentrated on deplatforming me everywhere possible. It's not just Spotify, it's also in events. So I've had several events cancelled, unfortunately, because of both public and private lobbying of the organizers. And what is happening now is We Believe in Israel is trying to posit themselves as experts on this issue of incitement of violence um, on Spotify. The interesting thing is the Israel advocacy movement has previously targeted Spotify on the basis of anti-Semitic music, supposedly on Spotify. But their definition of anti-Semitism has extended to even songs by Jay-Z, to <laughs> songs by popular rappers, to, to you know, and, and, and so what I believe has happened is the Israel advocacy movement made the decision that, and, and among the other, you know, myriad of Israel lobby groups that we have in the UK, and, and we have, you know, approaching 100, you know, it, it sounds hard to believe but they are named with names that obscure more than they reveal often. They, it's clear to them that they cannot use the anti-Semitism card on me and my music because then it would be applied against so many, you know, there's literal Nazis on Spotify, right? You cannot, you cannot say that a song like Long Live Palestine, using whatever definition of anti-Semitism you want to use, is worse than literal Nazis calling for another Holocaust, because that does exist on Spotify. But yet you're going for my music, and, and their statement, once challenged, was anti-Semitism doesn't even come into it. This is an incitement of violence. And the particular phrase which they are really um, is, is in their heads rent-free right now is globalizing the Intifada. Mm. They're not linguists, okay? They don't know the root of the, the, the verb for Intifada. They don't know its implications. They don't know the history of the phrase. They don't know about Tunis. They don't know about Iraq. They don't know about the countries where Intifada has been used. They're just applying it singularly to the second Intifada, when even the first Intifada was largely nonviolent also. So they're trying to really pull the wool over a lot of people's eyes on an industrial scale. And one aspect of that, and we have to remember the activities of the lobby in the UK are granular. They're granular and they are attritional. And so what needs to happen immediately when targeted in this way, you need to establish first the direction of where this is coming. So you can't deal with it on good faith. And then you need to demonstrate that you are not isolated. Hence why we had a campaign with the petition that has the signatures of um, everyone from you know, a princess of Jordan to a former UN special rapporteur on housing to a representative of UNESCO to uh, the speech, former speechwriter for Ban Ki Moon to, you know, to Re Roger Waters to hip hop legends like Styles P, like Akala, like a Mortal Technique. You know, we had a very, very wide grouping of people who signed this and expressed very, very clearly that they have an opposition to what the Israel lobby is trying to do. And so we believe in Israel and the rest of these organizations must be absolutely clear. If you want more people talking about the Israel lobby, continue to target me because more people will. And for the past half a decade, we have had our hands over our mouths, 
unable to identify the direction from which these punches were coming at us. And that is as the pro-Corbyn movement within the UK. Those days are gone. You will incur losses in a PR sense for everything you are doing. You were rattling off uh, the names, Loki, and uh, I actually put together this uh, slide just to show some of the people. Uh, we have um, Nkosi as well. I'm going to butcher the name because I'm a total Anglo-Saxon over here. But Mandela's son, who is an MP of the Parliament of South Africa. Um, and uh, you've got Lilani Farah who is a human rights advocate and former UN Special Rapporteur, uh, along with the celebrities you were naming, like Brian Eno, uh, Liam Cunningham awesome. of uh, Game of Thrones fame, yeah. but also a longtime actor. I don't want to you know, marginalize his work with just pop culture. Zara Gondor, uh, an actor, and Michael Malarkey, an actor, and Mark Ruffalo, an actor an who's fair, fairly, <laughs> fairly principled in his politics in the U.S. too. UB40, um, big, massive pop group. Uh, Marion Faithful, also a, a longtime musician, and says so an actor too. Uh, Peter Gabriel, around for a very long time. Uh, legend in music, Primal Scream, huge band for those who aren't familiar in the U.S. but in the U.K., huge band. Styles P, as you were mentioning, Sean Kuti, son of Fela, and Avelino, and Tamar Nafar, and Frederick, another musician, Wretch32. And I go out of my way to include all of these people. Green T, Peng, even if you don't know them, Getz, the musician. I put them all in here. 47 Soul, who's uh, Palestinian uh, music. And um, I put all of this in here, all of these musicians, just to say that, you know, I, I can't imagine if you are an independent artist trying to figure out how to get your act off the ground, what kind of dilemma you have to go through in your head over whether you want to choose your music or you want to actually take a stand against this Israel lobby, which you know is going to be out to crush your act and make sure that you're not able to play venues and make a difficulty for you to get your music out on platforms, suppress people's access to the, the tunes you record, to um, whatever you put out, uh, whether it's on YouTube, uh, the repercussions, lots of independent artists use Bandcamp. Um, and I, I just I can't imagine what those musicians are going through. So I think actually, to me, I find the musicians who most of the world do not know the fact that they'll stand with you to be really tremendous because I understand the costs that they are risking um, as people who uh, do stand on principle because I think there are a lot of artists who would be sa silent and, and I think there are probably artists who are on your side but they're being very calculating in saying like now's not my time to speak up for you. Well I mean also what they're underestimating is that I came up as a teenager through the open mics, have been making music for almost 20 years. These are my peers who have grown up with me, who have seen me go through trial and tribulation. We've supported each other through many things. The entire industry in this country has changed. I think it's important for people to know about some of the aspects on the artistic and cultural side of what the Israel lobby does. So there's an organization called the Creative Community for Peace. Now, this organization, when first founded, was part of the Israel Emergency Alliance, which was legally, in terms of the tax filings, the same organization as Stand With Us. And the founder and person that runs Creative Community for Peace, Dave Renza, is the husband of the founder of Stand With Us, which is well-known Israel lobby group focusing on the educational sector in the United States, which is funded directly from the Israeli Prime Minister's office. Now, Creative Community for Peace covers much of the executive level of the music industry. Um, it has a lot of backing from people within Universal Music um, and other 
record labels. And that was recently displayed when you saw the Sydney Festival boycott, which had 40% of the workforce pull out because the embassy had, had the Israeli embassy had funded um, the Sydney Festival. Now, it was a massive PR disaster, but Creative Community for Peace were the first line against it. And they came out with a statement signed by so many from the executive level of the music industry, but very few artists from the music industry. Now, Creative Community for Peace, just so we're absolutely clear, works on bringing artists to Israel to violate BDS. They worked on Alicia Keys bringing her to Israel. They worked on Macy Gray. With both of those things, they uh, coordinated directly with the Israeli consulate in the in Los Angeles. Now, what we're talking about is an attempt to astroturf support for Israel within the arts. But if we were to assume that this explicitly anti-BDS organization, it's, it, it doesn't make uh, any secret about it. It's anti-BDS. Its whole purpose is to encourage, you know, and it has this disingenuous name like Creative Community for Peace, but its whole purpose is to bring artists together um, with Israel. Now, that's one as aspect of what one could conceivably face within the music industry. The other aspect, as you mentioned, with YouTube and algorithmic stuff, you know, the ADL is a trusted flagger, the Anti-Defamation League, is a trusted flagger of YouTube. Now, it internally, the ADL, defines anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism. And even the FBI in 1969, in its own documents, internal memos, said it is incredible to assume that the ADL is not furnished to an official of the Israeli government. Mm -hmm. And the FBI document even questioned if the ADL was in violation of the U.S. Foreign Agents Registration Act to this extent. So what we're saying is that if you take this stance and if you take it in a consistent and committed way, and if you support the direct action to shut down the war machine, which is in your country, then of course you're going to come up against these different roadblocks, which will be put in front of you. So it's not a surprise for me, but as you said, I have a, a probably a greater, but still not a complete awareness of the stakes when dealing with this stuff. But other artists that have taken this step, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful for it. And, um, you know, the lobby needs to be aware that the network is strong and these are not just people doing it um, in, a, in a shallow and superficial way. They're people in contact with me. You know, I'm actually curious, obviously this intense, very targeted attack on you involving like every apparatus of the Israel lobby has been so extreme, but you also have other music. Like I remember one of the first things I saw by you like 10 years ago, maybe more was, um, there was the song about, you know, they're calling me a terrorist. It was a song about like, it was about basically about the war on terror uh, and excellent song. Uh, and that was Thank like you. about imperialism overall. And then, you know, you have other songs that I remember hearing, like referring to other countries that the U.S. is targeting, the U.K. is targeted, about the weapons industry. Was there ever a backlash to your music, the way you've experienced now, like from the security state in the U.K.? Um, did you ever have like things getting canceled as a result of your music before? Or is this kind of like the first time this sort of attack has, you know, been thrown at you? Well, I was deported in airports a lot. Um, I am not given a visa to travel to the United States. So as far as I know, I can't travel to the United States. I've Even been, as a British citizen? Yes. Wow. I, I've been stopped under Schedule 7 Terrorism Act um, before. Um, I did have events cancelled. I've had my music used in prevent training workshops. Now, prevent is the British government's wow. uh, counter-terror. That particular song, Terrorist has been used in training by uh, Like on what basis? Actually, like, no, sorry, what, what? Like, what does that even mean? Well, what I've, you know, the version of events I've been given by three different people who attended three different training workshops is that it was used as an example of things to be careful about kids watching. And so wow. what Prevent That's does crazy. is it opens the space. It's It, it deals with the quote-unquote pre-criminal space, which says that 
if somebody displays the potential to be on a conveyor belt towards an act of political violence, and let's not forget that in Britain, you have a one in 16 million chance of being anywhere near an act of political violence. That's according to Chris Hunter, who is the British military expert on terrorism in the United States. According to Frank Harvey, you're four times more likely to be struck by lightning. You know, you're more likely to be shot by a toddler with a with a gun. You are more likely to likely to die in a vending machine. Um, these these are the figures, you know, around yeah. this stuff. But what you have is this threat inflation, yeah. that is an industry in 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 countries like Britain and the United States, and therefore, um, th my music became almost a useful ornament or tool within that to add to this sort of criminalization slash blacklisting of people through the extremism analysis unit um, in the government, which looks, you know, people have been expelled from the Labour Party for retweeting me before. And the retweets that they were retweeting wow. were UN general resolutions. It's like, it's, it's, it sounds like a joke. Like that, yeah. just, that sounds so, yeah. in a way it's almost, if it wasn't so frightening, that would be a little flattering that you're, you're yeah. viewed by the security. And, and they, and they have a perfect example. So this terrorist song that you mentioned, really? this is, this is the warning that comes up on it. Wow. So yeah. I wanted to ask you about it because even I'm logged in, even when I'm yeah. logged in and I have proof that I'm of age, I yeah, still click get on it this. and watch what happens. Click on it. And well, and I also it. can't get it to play. I'll also be clear. I tried to get your video to play and it would not play for me. And, and look at that. It has over 5 million views, over yeah. 63,000 likes. It's obviously popular. People who watch it like it. Wait, what happens? Click on it. Does it ask you again? Does it prompt you? Well, this, you? Isn't, I, this is just a screenshot. Oh, so screenshot. I don't have the video, but I can tell you that I wasn't able to get it to play for me, yeah. which was really uh, bizarre. And so I was going to ask you, you know, this seems to be the only video that is being targeted, but, um, but yeah. I, mean, I, had, uh, I had two others targeted in that way. I had an interview with Chris Hedges that was targeted that way. And I had a strangely, um, a sort of monologue about World War One and a retrospective anti-war argument against World War One <laughs> that also had that same stuff uh, put on there. That's so, that's just like so crazy, the level of censorship uh, being enforced against you. I'm curious, like, why do you think this is happening now? You've been making music, you said you've been doing this for making music for 20 years. You've almost, been doing open yeah. mics almost, and all these things. Almost. And then you have official music videos that have been out since like, you know, 2008 or something, maybe before that. Mm -hmm. um, you've been active for a long time. I've known your name for a very long time. Before even I was a journalist, I saw your music. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've been doing this for a while. So mm -hmm. why in 2022 is this happening now? What has, do you think, changed? Is there something in British political culture? Is it something about what's happening in the world? You're now like a media figure. You have a show on Mint Press. Like if you had to speculate, if you're the Israel lobby, why do you choose now to target Loki? Well, I mean, they tried in 2009 to blame a Marks and Spencer's getting smashed on me inciting it supposedly at a rally. Um, these things have, have followed me throughout my career, even when I stopped making music. Incidentally, that was when I was being um, detained the most, strangely. Um, so it's been a mainstay. Um, I think it's escalated now for a few reasons. Uh, the first of them would be that the lobby was able to consolidate its forces in this in britain very very well around corbyn mm -hmm. meaning that the it became a well-oiled juggernaut which was the nexus between governmental institutions journalists and israel lobby groups and they were able to on an industrial scale cancel people we're talking about thousands of people and one thing i think is important to remember about prevent is that it opens the space for counter-terror police to question children as young as three about their political beliefs and the political beliefs of their parents without the knowledge of their parents. So, you know, it's really draconian. And, and yeah, as I was saying, these things have been going on throughout the time that I've been making music. In terms of now, the, the sort of perfect storm is definitely on one hand, the, um, the Corbyn 
the defeat of the Corbyn project and it happening with the coordination of groups with an umbilical relationship to the Israeli embassy and the other aspect and, and then being in a powerful enough position to now step into the arts very clearly. But then the other part of it being um, Ukraine and the way in which people are being forced to submit to a very, very simple minded caricature narrative of the way the world works. You know, it is the further insulation and and little NATO attitude of the world that says this is the only reality which exists. If you question what's being done with your taxes at the same time as all of you know, you know, Britain and the US are in economic crisis. Yeah. You know, the cost of living is flying up. Yet simultaneous to that, the governments that have told us for over 10 years in Britain, you know, prior to the pandemic, 130 people, 130,000 people, according to Danny Dorling from uh, Cambridge University, died from austerity. Therefore, you were statistically more likely to die from austerity than you were from terrorism in Britain. Now, that shows us that you have all this money to send to this NATO war against the nuclear power, who has actually said quite clearly that what you said in 2008 at the NATO conference where you said Ukraine will become a part of NATO is an existential threat mm. to us. And so therefore, to buttress this policy of siphoning arms, training, and all types of involvement in fighting Russia, you need hegemonic power within the society. And to establish that hegemony, people like us have to be rendered, quote unquote, beyond the pale. We have to be rendered as, we have to be irrationalized. We have to be seen as people that are completely persona non grata. And that is the way that you are able to manage a frankly sort of totalitarian system when it comes to information, at least. Nonetheless, also political subjectivity. You know, you have a hierarchy of political subjectivity. We have no reflection within the political systems within which, within which we live. We have no ability to vote for anyone that has anywhere near the same ideas about foreign policy. You can barely get people in the political system that agree with very basic issues of nationalizing um, key aspects of, of people's utilities in the UK, let alone getting people to stop arms sales to Israel or to Saudi or to pull out of NATO or to any of these things. You know, the vast majority of the British population are against having nuclear weapons. You have no reflection of that within the political system. And it's because in a lot of the cases, we actually have media literally via NATO. So um, the, the former foreign editor of Sky News was simultaneously an advisor to the deputy commander of NATO. This is during what? NATO's... Yeah. Lorna Ward, if I remember correctly. Simultaneously to be in the foreign editor. You've got numerous people that are part of actual lobby groups who work for major newspapers in the editor role. <clears throat> More of that will be revealed soon. You had numerous BBC employees who simultaneously worked for NATO. At the same time? At the same time. You have them now. Um, you also have GB News, you know, this, this other uh, uh, news is. station in the UK which simultaneously one of its presenters works on strategic communications for NATO. So what you build is you build this kind of uh, surround sound of one version of the world events, which is deeply out of sync with the rest of the world. You know, you have to be absolutely clear about that. You know, people are under no illusions about what's happening in these places in the rest of the world. They don't view it in these bizarre moralistic, immature ways, right? That, that, that doesn't mean that suffering is not real. And that doesn't mean that 
you know, I sympathize with every single human being on the basis of their humanity. I do personally. However, however, to act as if that somehow negates any analysis of geopolitics, of regional actors, of specific interests which, which states have and are pursuing very, very clearly in a material way with our money is just, you know, it's just the, the peak of naivety, in my opinion. You know, I, I have to say with, I really love what you said about the way, um, real quick, Kevin, you might as well just keep us all on so that like you're in the conversation, just keep it like this. All righty. Uh, otherwise it just, other, cause I want you to be there. <laughs> otherwise it looks like you're like- No, no, I just, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm thinking like a film person. I'm thinking like the film person and I don't like these black bars yeah. where like the space isn't being annoying. used. But, I know it's annoying, but it actually looks cooler. And then that way it's like, not, I'm just like, not just standing there by myself, like not right. talking. Um, but no, I mean, in the, I, I really like what you were saying about, about how the rest of the world is not like delusional and doesn't see the conflict in Ukraine in this weird, like stupid cartoonish way. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit um, more about that because I mean, even being here, like in Lebanon, even the most pro-American, like anti-Hezbollah, you know, uh, pro-Saudi, pro-West people here uh, don't see the conflict in Ukraine the way the British or the Americans or the rest of Europe does. There really is like a recognition around the world that like that Russia it was provoked by NATO, whether you don't have to agree with what they did, but there's a recognition of that. I don't know, so can you talk a little bit about, more about how you see like the sort of globe watching Europe, especially as somebody who's like, you're British, but you also have a family from elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, basically, in Britain and the United States, we are <clears throat> some of the most effectively propagandized civilizations in human history, probably the most. And what you have is all these tiny, granular ways in which the enforcement of particular narratives is put in place within the society. You know, you look at the response of someone like Imran Khan, for example. Now, let's not forget that Pakistan had a very important role in the mobilization of fighters against the Soviet Union, right? People in Pakistan are not necessarily predisposed to sympathize with, say, the Russian side of the argument. But when Imran Khan came out and said what he said, everyone knew that he, he said, we are not your slaves. We're not just going to do what you want us to do. We have interests as a state. And it's not in our interest to go into war with Russia. That's not in our interest. And the vast majority of Pakistanis agree with that, mm -hmm. agree with that. And even after the coup, you haven't seen the coup government really be able to implement the kind of subjugation to US policy around Russia that they would have hoped they would. And also, Pakistan has suffered greatly from the war, of ter war on terror. You will not see a population which is prepared to be used as a base against Iran, against China, and against Afghanistan, no matter what the US military and the US government are trying to force Pakistan to do. It's going to be extremely difficult because the population is opposed to it. The support doesn't exist. And so it's almost as if we're in this sort of circle of self-satisfied, smug fools, useful idiots who just parrot these mantras that are pumped into our heads 24-7, not looking critically, you know, what is the Ukraine NATO Civic League, for instance? Have people actually looked into the way that NATO has sought to astroturf support for it on a granular level within Ukrainian society across the past few decades? This is real, okay? This is real. And, you know, the truth, I believe, is people in Britain and the United States often, often have a much greater distance from the actual impact of their imperial wars. A lot of US citizens, the closest they get to it is by being in the US army and being on a military base in one of their outposts. And even then they live in a little America, okay? They don't really see the full impact 
of what it's done around the world, of what its behemoth juggernaut of a weapons industry um, wreaks on the rest of the world. But other people know it very, very well. And even those who, as you say, advocate for a better relationship with the United States, the vast majority of them are not volunteering for a puppet relationship with the, relation, with the United States. They want a more beneficial relationship with the United States for their interests. So when they look at this constant push to war and this using of other people to fight to the last drop of other people's blood, because that's what they'll do to you. They'll render your society chaos. They're economically at war with 25% of the world's population, sanctioning 25% of the world's population. We have to be clear, this is a policy that even people within Britain and the United States, if they knew the reality of it, would probably not support. And so that's why you have on this industrial scale, uh, you know, the, the, the brainwashing of them in, in a very Bernaysian sense. Well, as we wind this yeah. down, I want to ask you about uh, the Assange case, about Julian Assange. Uh, but in particular, I want to take advantage of your expertise as somebody who lives uh, in the UK, who, who, who has been based in the UK, who has ex some experience with the system in the United Kingdom. And just to, uh, well, my overarching point is just to make this uh, point, uh, share with people just how, uh, I guess, colonized might be the word, but how deputized, deputized is a better way of putting it, deputized the UK is when it comes to serving the US and making sure that the Assange extradition is actually shepherded and that he makes it to the US at all costs. But then to get into what uh, Pretty Patel represents to you as the Home Office Secretary. Uh, I've been spending some time looking at her. You know, not only is she uh, just in general, a reprehensible individual, but uh, she's advocating for the expansion of the Official Secrets Acts in the UK, something that would be very awful for whistleblowers as, as well as journalists, um, and especially those journalists who are willing to engage in uh, investigative uh, reporting on the US security, oh, sorry, on the UK security services, as well as the US security services. Uh, because I'm familiar with the system in the UK of, uh, of D-notices in which uh, they'll send you, this is what happens to our friends over at Declassified UK, you get sent these D-notices that basically intimidate and harass you into censoring your work or else you might face legal repercussions. But uh, Pretty Patel, um, and I'll, I'll put a few images of her on screen while you're giving your answer just so people actually know who she is. But I I understand she's also there's also this controversy right now while she's handling this extradition with Rwanda asylum seekers. Um, and I, I barely have the ability to get into that while my focus has been on Assange. But just in general, she seems to really represent something despicable in UK society. Well, Priti Patel came out of the Henry Jackson Political Council, the Henry Jackson Society. Um, of course, named after someone they nicknamed Senator Boeing because he always voted in favor of the uh, arms companies. This organization also gave birth to Michael Gove. It gave birth to Amber Rudd. It had on its signators the Richard Dearlove, the former head of MI6. It had former heads of CIA as the signators to its founding letter. It's also shared funders with the Friends of the IDF. It shares funders with illegal Israeli settlements in the West Bank. And of course, you have Alan Mendoza, who is very prominent at the Henry Jackson Society, also on the board of the JNF, which builds settlements in Palestine. It's very hawkish, very, very right wing, and it's actually actively campaigned against Julian Assange. Um, an important thing to remember also about this campaign against Assange, as you rightly put it, is an extension of this servility to access, servility for access system we have of media in Britain. And the D-notice 
stuff is part of it, whereby people are given basically friendly directives from uh, civil servants about what they would prefer not to be covered. And if you do cover, you know, as you saw with declassified at one point, they were blacklisted. And so the, the MOD said, we've been told that we do not respond to any of your questions. In terms of um, with Assange, what this also reveals is the complete state capture of the judiciary in the country, because you've had people with major conflicts of interest involved. Uh, Lady Abathnot was the initial judge that dealt with her case, her son um, having intimate uh, role in um, a sort of private intelligence company that was working on something related to WikiLeaks. Her husband was a former uh, defense minister who, again, was linked to anti-Assange activities. And then on the other side of it, you had the final judge that made this ruling that he should be extradited after the initial judge had said that he was a suicide risk if he was extradited to the United States. Um, this latest ruling that he should be extradited came from a judge who is very close friends with the very minister, Alan Duncan, who, by the way, you know, ironically and interestingly, in his book wrote that the uh, conservative friends of Israel think they control the foreign office. And they're probably right because he was canceled by the Israel lobby in this country and not able to actually become the uh, foreign minister. But regardless of that, he was very much willing to do U.S. bidding in terms of Assange to the point where he referred to Assange as a little worm. Now, a close friend of his, a very close friend of his, who he has regular contact with, was the judge in Assange's case. Also, in addition to that, we have to remember that um, the whistleblowers in the United States came out with evidence that when the CIA were planning to kidnap and or assassinate Julian Assange, just to speak to this point of Britain's being Britain sort of being a deputy to the US empire. Britain agreed to do the shooting if there was a right. shootout, yeah. right? So what you have clearly is this relationship where Britain is a junior partner. Yes, Britain has around 150 military bases around the world. Yes, it has a network of tax havens, which essentially um, account for 37% of all the tax losses in the world. Um, yes, it still has a presence in many, many countries. It can't really be considered a post-colonial nation when one in 10 of its soldiers are foreign nationals. However, when it comes to the US empire, it is more of a junior partner, but also in addition to that, it's a sort of propaganda arm of the US uh, military. So a lot of the psychological warfare type of stuff is being done through NGOs that function with funding from the British Foreign Office and whatnot. So we've seen all of those hypocrisies laid out very, very clear in the case of Julian Assange. And remember, it's a war against our right to know. Julian is not being punished for the things that WikiLeaks put out there that were against the interests of the Russian government having out there. He's not being punished for things that he published, information he published about the Iranian government or about the Chinese government or about the Turkish government or about the UAE government or about the Saudi government. None of those, what our media calls despotic regimes, are trying to kill him. It's our governments that are trying to kill him. And what he's specifically being punished for is Guantanamo Bay, the Afghan war logs, war logs the Iraq war logs. You know, let's not forget about Guantanamo Bay, by the way. If it wasn't for WikiLeaks, we wouldn't know that they imprisoned children in Guantanamo Bay because the, the mm -hmm. US government was not telling us. One of the youngest prisoners in Guantanamo Bay, Yasser Talal al-Sahrani, this man was taken when he was about 17 years old, 16, 17 years old. He later was found dead in his cell and the US government claimed that he committed suicide. There was an we Al Jazeera journalist there too, Sami Al Hash. Wow, you know, and and there's so much that we would not know were it not for WikiLeaks and what Julian Assange did. You know, so 
we have a great debt um, to Julian and, and WikiLeaks and the organization. Um, and, you know, they are trying to murder our right to know. Mm -hmm. Well said. <laughs> and uh, one last quick point here, and then I know we need to conclude. Uh, it When I was in the UK very briefly to cover a hearing, uh, this, this hypocrisy, this deputization um, was on full display as I would get into cars with drivers who were baffled that Julian Assange could be extradited to the United States when there had just been uh, at least involuntary manslaughter, if not worse, of Harry Dunn by Ann Sekoulis. Well said. Who, uh, who the U.S. is refusing and protecting from being extradited to the U.K. And in fact, they can't even get hearings scheduled in the U.K. to advance her case uh, because of obstruction going on behind the scenes. And in addition to that, someone from the British Foreign Office helped her leave the country. The message, the exact message which was found said, be on the next flight out of here. And when Harry Dunn's long-suffering family were taken to the White House to meet Donald Trump, he said to them, we have Ansakulas next door. Would you like to meet her? So yes, we have seen. And initially they tried to claim she was the spouse of a diplomat. But what comes out is that actually she was a CIA agent. So what you're saying is that you don't have sovereignty. You have over 100 US bases in Britain. But yet people have lived with this constantly repeated mantra of the idea that Britain somehow has some type of sovereignty. Uh, well, Loki, let's give you a chance to uh, tell people where they can go to support your work, find your work, and and then we'll be done with the show. Thank you. I want to thank you both so much for um, allowing me the platform to speak. I appreciate it. Please do um, follow me on Twitter. Please do sign the petition, which is out there as an open letter to Spotify, around almost 45,000 people have signed it already. The campaign is ongoing. It's both visible and invisible. It's both public and behind the scenes. Um, some more of it will become public as things go on. We are documenting everything. Um, so please do you know, get involved and support independent media, which is giving you this kind of information, because the truth is, is we may not be here for much longer. Yeah, that's scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it may not be that quick of an answer, but if you can give a quick answer, um, since you that's work at Mint Press, Press News, <laughs> since you work at Mint, since you work at Mint Press News, and you were hit by PayPal and and oh, and, yeah. and, and GoFundMe, yeah. um, it, has any of that been resolved? What it, can you quickly give a status update as we as we go out of here? Well, because I've been here, I haven't been completely up to date on what is or what isn't happening. I do know that the money which PayPal had seized effectively has been made available oh. to Mint Press, um, which is good. However, obviously, it sets a dangerous precedent, which, you know, Manar, um, the ch editor in chief of Mint Press, actually points to a trajectory from when PayPal did this to WikiLeaks to PayPal now doing this to Mint Press. So again, I would say support Mint Press and what they do through Patreon and through other ways that you can make sure you watch the videos, share the videos and fight back against the algorithmic um, shadow banning that we face. All right. Thanks. It's been good to talk with you. And for those who are subscribers and supporters of the Unauthorized Disclosure podcast, uh, we thank you. I'll just do my good diligence as somebody who has to care about keeping this show going and put up our Patreon <laughs> as well. And then uh, remind you that we're over here in case we get banned from YouTube. Um, and so we may be in other locations at some point. Uh, that's Rockfin if you're listening and not watching. Patreon.com slash unauthorized disclosure if you're listening and not watching. And uh, we'll be back next week with another episode.